Uh, thanks to the organizers. Thanks for all of you for sticking around and staying awake. I hope to keep you awake throughout the talk. We'll see how it goes. Um, I think this talk is going to be mostly on the convergence side of things. So that's my hope. I hope I'll sort of have a nice feel-good talk to, to end, end the conference with. But you can tell me the question and answer period why that's wrong. All right, so what I want to talk about today is um, the absence of animal welfare considerations uh, in climate policy. And what I'm going to do is use uh, the fifth assessment report from the IPCC. So the IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, and they have the job of uh, sort of gathering and synthesizing the latest information about climate change. Um, and the idea is they sort of put all that information together for policymakers who can then use that information as a basis for, for making smart policy about climate change. Um, and they issue these assessment reports regularly. Uh, so what I'm going to look at today is the fifth assessment report, uh, which is the latest one. It came out in 2013 and 2014. Um, and I want to use that as, as an example of what is and isn't being discussed when it comes to climate impacts. Um, so that's the idea. Um, now these, these IPCC assessment reports are sort of odd things. They're, they're kind of reports by aggregation. Um, they have three working groups, and then in, within each working group, different groups of authors write different chapters, and all gets sort of piled together at the end and edited in all kinds of weird ways. Um, so keep that in mind as I'm sort of working through and talking about what is and, is and isn't in there. Um, what I'm going to argue is that considerations of animal welfare are almost entirely absent from the considerations of climate impacts um, in the assessment report. And I'm going to argue that there's no excuse for this. Um, so I will be arguing about an absence. Um, I'm going to put up some examples of what is in the report rather than examples of you know, discussions of animal welfare. Um, but it's difficult to put up uh, evidence of absence, uh, especially in 4,400 pages of text. So that's where we're at. All right, so first uh, I'm going to lay out some uh, assumptions that I'm going to be making. Uh, second, I want to say a little bit more about the role of these assessment reports in climate policy. And then I want to go on to look at uh, what the fifth assessment report has to say about the impacts of climate policy on animals. And I want to compare that to what it says about the impacts of climate policy on humans. Then I'm going to argue that the way that it does talk about the impacts on animals, namely uh, in terms of ecosystem services, biodiversity, and human welfare, um, aren't adequate, that those aren't enough for really capturing animal welfare. I'll consider an objection about our moral responsibility for animal welfare. Um, and then at the very end, I want to talk sort of about some very practical policy issues. All right, so here are the assumptions. Um, first of all, I'm assuming that there are creatures besides humans that have a welfare that's of direct moral importance. Um, I actually don't think this is a very controversial thing to say in ethics at all anymore, um, thanks to the work of, of animal ethicists. There's a long list of you know, even mainstream ethical theorists who really don't care about animals uh, who make this point in their writing. So I think this is a fairly uncontroversial thing to say. Second, I'm going to assume that if uh, your choice might have a significant effect on something's welfare, that you should take that fact into consideration in making the choice. Uh, again, I think this is pretty uncontroversial in ethics. It's a claim about how interests ought to matter to us in our decision making. Third, I'm going to take for granted the sort of basic scientific consensus about climate change is correct. Uh, climate change is largely produced by human activity. And the choices that we make about our policies can affect uh, how much and what kind of climate change we get. And then fourth, I'm going to assume, although I'm going to say a little bit about why, uh, that climate change is likely to have a significant effect on animal welfare. All right. So we've, we've talked a lot about various effects that climate change might have on animals. I'm going to try to get through this part really quickly. Um, but uh, what I'd like you to think about, um, I feel like we've been talking about the effects on animals in these very sort of broad what exists and how much suffering. Um, and I, I'd like you to try to think about it more empathetically for just a moment from the point of view of animals trying to deal with the circumstances that climate change is about to bring about, what, what the quality of their lives are like. OK, um, so there's sort of three kinds of effects that I think are relevant to climate policy. Um, the first are the direct effects, and these are the ones that, that most of us are probably more, most familiar with. Right? Heat's going to increase. Um, animals have different sort of heat tolerance ranges. Uh, some of them might be able to migrate to more hospitable climates. Others won't be able to migrate and will die off. Even those who do migrate are going to face all kinds of challenges. Um, they're going to have to find uh, new food sources. 
they might be competing or cooperating with new, new species, they're going to have to protect themselves from new predators, fight off new diseases, adjust to new seasonal cycles. So even for the sort of successful ones, there's going to be a lot of difficulty in their future. Um, temperature extremes, uh, monthly heat records are supposed to be 12 times more common by the 2040s. So we all have that to look forward to. Um, but these are things that, that affect and make lives difficult for animals. Um, extreme weather events can obviously displace animal populations just as easily as they can displace human populations. And many of these extreme weather events have sort of further effects. Uh, for example, fires have effects on air and water quality. Um, floods and other things have effects uh, that are similar. Then there are indirect effects. Um, and much of these come from the disruption to human, social, and economic systems. Um, and what that sort of produces for the lives of animals. So if you think about things like sea level rise or extreme weather events, um, that's going to cause a lot of human population dislocation, uh, changes to, the, to where we live and the way we use land, um, and that's going to affect animal habitat. Droughts and floods are likely to lead to food insecurity. Uh, economic shocks, the shocks are going to disrupt agricultural markets. So think about how people treat their livestock when they can't afford to, to feed it anymore. So particularly for, for agricultural animals, there might be a, a lot of consequences there. Um, and both increased migration and economic deprivation uh, are well known to make violent conflict among humans more likely, and to think about the impact of warfare uh, for animals who live uh, near where wars are happening. Finally, um, there are effects of some of the choices that we might make about mitigation and adaptation. So I just threw some examples up here. There are lots of different possibilities. Um, when we think about mitigation and moving to clean energy, to the extent that we adopt biofuels, we're going to change land use patterns. It's probably going to involve incursions into animal habitats. One of the ways that people are thinking about adaptation to uh, variability of water supply is by building more reservoirs and bigger dams. Um, but of course, that might take away resources and habitats that are needed by animals. And then finally, even some of the strategies we might choose for preventing extinction, and we've talked about some of these already, um, things like ass assisted migration and ex situ preservation, right? The, the habitats that the animals are moved out of, whatever animals are left there might have a hard time. Whatever used to eat the pica now has less to eat. Um, the animals in the new habitat they get moved to have you know, something new that they have to deal with, um, and so on. And I think uh, the animal welfare folks are well familiar with some of the worries about animal welfare that come from uh, breeding and captivity and, and programs like that. So depending on what strategies we choose and how we choose to carry them out, um, there could be significant animal welfare consequences there. Now, I haven't talked about all the stuff that Oscar said, um, all the stuff about the sort of misery that we might be alleviating. So lots of other consequences here. I don't mean to just say, you know, it's all bad. Um, these are sort of empirical questions. Um, but but my, my view here is that, that these, these impacts are going to be significant. Um, we shouldn't assume it's just going to be a wash and we don't need to worry about it. Okay. Um, so, I want to say a little bit about the IPCC assessment, of course. Um, and this requires a little bit of history. So, you know, back in the good old days when we thought climate change was a problem we were going to fix, um, everybody sort of was talking about mitigation. That was really the only thing people talked about. Um, how do we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions in order to prevent dangerous climate change from happening? Um, and as we kept failing to meet our mitigation targets year after year after year, uh, people started to be willing to talk about adaptation. Adaptation had sort of previously been taboo. It was only if you didn't want to bother to mitigate that you would talk about adaptation. But people realized that some kind of climate change is looking inevitable, and we better figure out how to adapt to it. Most recently, uh, there's begun to be talk about what they call loss and damage. Um, loss and damage are the sort of bad effects of climate change that we weren't able to mitigate or adapt to. So these are sort of the, the bad consequences that we're going to be stuck with. Again, that used to be taboo. Um, now there's a lot more discussion going on about that. So um, in, in all of this discussion, what people are really focused on, particularly in the most recent assessment reports, are the likely impacts of various courses of action, various choices we might make about what to do. Um, so about the effect, to mitigate, um, the effect of mitigating to various levels, 
Uh, so for example, what's the effect on agriculture going to be if warming reaches the four degree mark? We might get that high. Um, the impacts of various strategies for adaptation. Um, you know, how does shift to clean energy affect agriculture or freshwater ecosystems? And in loss and damage, which of the losses are likeliest to occur, which are still preventable, and what their magnitude will be. So a huge effort is going into trying to assess the good consequences and the bad consequences of various choices that we might make regarding climate change. Um, and in part for this reason, a, a lot of the assessment report, and this is particularly uh, true for the, the second working group's uh, report, um, it's written in the language of risk assessment. So you see a lot of talk of risk assessment and how to manage risk. Um, and if you look at the quotes at the bottom there, um, this is the folks who are at the, from the second working group describing the aim of the report. They say it evaluates patterns of risks and potential benefits. <coughs> so risks and potential benefits are shifting due to climate change. It considers how impacts and risks related to climate change can be reduced and managed through adaptation and mitigation assesses needs, options, opportunities, constraints, resilience, limits, and other aspects associated with adaptation. All right, so that's what the assessment reports are trying to do. One thing I'd like you to notice in that bottom quote is that there's nothing there that says for people. Right? There's nothing there that rules out evaluating impacts on or risks to animals. Right? So, the mission of these assessment reports is very broadly described. And in fact, we see the same kind of threat. If you look at the definitions of some of the key terms, right? impacts are described as effects on natural and human systems. Risk is defined as the potential for consequences where something of value is at stake, where the outcome is uncertain, recognizing the diversity of values. And adaptation is the process of adjustment to actual or expected climate and its effects. Right? So again, Nothing here would seem to exclude animals from the main thing that the assessments or reports are supposed to be looking into. And yet, what we see is that animal welfare is almost entirely, entirely neglected in the reports. Um, animals are talked about, but they're talked about almost entirely in terms of impacts on species. So you can sort of think of this as, as a concern about biodiversity narrowly construed, um, impacts on biodiversity broadly construed to include more than just species, um, and impacts on ecosystem services. So what I'd like to do is go through each of those three things and take a look at what the assessment report has to say about consequences for animals in these terms. Okay, so let's look at the, uh, impacts on species first. Um, so the report mostly looks at impacts on species that are related to their range, abundance, and extinction. Other things are all sort of assessed in terms of their impact on range, abundance, and extinction. And this first quote is from the ocean acidification chapter, sort of an example of the kind of thing you see in this regard. Some corals and temperate fishes experience disturbances to behavior and <coughs> navigation and their ability to tell con specifics from predators. However, there's no evidence for these effects to persist on evolutionary timescales in the few groups analyzed. So, from the perspective of someone concerned about animal welfare, you think about what's being said here. Right? Surely disturbances to behavior, navigation, and the ability to tell conspecifics from predators would be pretty awful. Right? Think about what your life would be like if that happened to you. And you might think it's no consolation that these circumstances won't persist on an evolutionary time scale. All right, second, this is from the uh, terrestrial and inland water systems chapter. There is, however, broad agreement that land use and habitat fragmentation in particular will pose serious impediments to species adaptation to climate change as it's projected to reduce the capacity of many species to track climate. By track climate here, they, move, they mean sort of moving to more hospitable climates as their current climate becomes uh, uninhabitable. These considerations lead to the assessment that future species extinctions are a high risk because the consequences of climate change are potentially severe, widespread, and irreversible, irreversible as extinctions constitute the permanent loss of unique life forms. All right, so again, try to sort of look past the language and think about the reality that's being described here, right? The inability of species to track climate is likely to be a pretty miserable experience. And you might think it's a problem not just because of its effect on 
risk of extinction and the loss of unique life forms, but also because of the terribly difficult lives that animals will live as they try to make those adjustments. All right, uh, third example. This is also from terrestrial and inland water systems. Even species whose populations are not projected to decline rapidly over the next century can face substantial extinction debt. That is, will be in unfavorable climates that over a period of many centuries are projected to lead to large reductions in population size and increase the risk of extinction. And again, right, from the point of view of animal welfare, you might think that being in unfavorable climates, right, very sort of polite term, um, it's not just bad because of the extinction debt, right? That is to say, the increase of risk of extinction over the longer term, right, that befalls the species, but also because of what it's like for the lives of conscious sentient creatures. An unfavorable climate is one where there's not enough to eat, right? where what kept you safe from predators and diseases in the past isn't working anymore, where you're increas increasingly watching your offspring suffer and die, kin suffer and die, where fewer resources are leading to increased conflict, and that destabilizes, at least for social animals, group structures and increases violent confrontations. All right, so that's sort, of, that's sort of what we're talking about. All right, um, impacts are also described, described uh, in terms of impacts on biodiversity broadly construed and ecosystem services. So here are the definitions uh, of biodiversity and ecosystem services shorten the ecosystem services one for you. Um, biodiversity is defined as variability among living organisms from terrestrial, marine, and marine ecosystems. It includes variability of the genetic species and ecosystem levels. And ecosystem services are the benefits that ecosystems provide <coughs> to people. Okay, so here's kind of an example of how impacts get assessed in these terms. Um, this is from the marine systems chapter. Global marine species redistribution and marine biodiversity reduction in sensitive regions will challenge the sustained provision of fisheries productivity and other ecosystem services. Um, in addition, in the mitigation chapter, uh, it's a whole chapter where they, they evaluate the impacts of various what they call transformation pathways. So these are different, different ways that we might get from where we are now to a stabilization of greenhouse gases and they sort of evaluate the consequences of these different pathways. Um, and in that chapter, the only way that the effects on non-humans are considered at all is in terms of the consequences for biodiversity. All right, so in sum, I think, what the report seems to care about here, what it seems to be focused on when it comes to animals, is diversity among the kinds that exist and their functional role in ecosystems, um, or at least those aspects of ecosystems that, that humans care about. Um, animals having to find a way to live in inhospitable climates is understood to be a problem because it might lead to those animals being less abundant or even to the extinction of their species. Extinction is a problem because, uh, on the one hand, these animals might have provided services to humans, um, and also perhaps because these species are unique life forms. So there's a sort of suggestion of possibly not right. All right, now I want to contrast this with the way that the report talks about humans. Um, in talking about humans, we see a very different set of impacts assessed. Um, so I would give you a quote, but they were super long and I couldn't fit them on the slide, so what I'm doing is sort of summarizing an enormous amount of stuff here. Um, but here are the sorts of considerations that we see discussed when it comes to humans. Risk to normal human activities, um, including growing food or working outdoors, to agricultural incomes, displacement and migration, and the social responses to it, economic shocks, extreme weather, such as heat waves, floods, droughts, and fires, and the social responses to those, heat-related deaths, gender inequality, education, property, infrastructure and social services, psychological well-being and sense of security, individual household and community coping capacities and need for external assistance, social upheaval, generalized anxiety, depression, aggression, and complex psychopathology, chronic psychological distress and increased incidence of suicide. So nostalgia, which is defined as a distressing sense of loss that people experience when their land is damaged. Um, and the freedom and capacity to live with dignity. Right? So notice that for humans, the effects on quality of life are, are amply described. Um, and think about how many things on that list might be issues for the quality of life 
or animals as well. Right? So many of these are things that don't just affect human beings. Okay, so for humans, impacts on the quality of lives plays a really prominent role in discussions of the risks that are to be avoided, um, as well it should, I think. We don't just care about how many and what kind of humans will remain in existence. We don't just care about the benefits, economic or otherwise, um, that humans will provide to others. And we're not concerned about the effects on an evolutionary time scale. All right, um, there are two exceptions to the contrast that I'm trying to draw here. And I think it's worth, you know, since I'm sort of drawing this sort of contrast, it's worth showing you what, what the exceptions look like. Um, so the first exception comes from the ethics section in the Working Group 3 report. And in the ethics section, at least the beginning part of it, tries to make room, at least sort of, uh, for the existence of morally important animal welfare. So the authors divide ethics into two categories, their claims about justice and their claims about value. And they define justice in a way that rules out animals. Um, so justice is defined as a matter of whether people and nations receive what they are due or have a right to. But value is defined in a way that could be applied to animals. So the report states specifically, all values may be anthropocentric or there may be non-human values. And then they give us the following claim, the one that's up here. If animals, plant species, and ecosystems do have value in their own right, then the moral impact of climate change can't be gauged by its effects on human beings alone. If climate change leads to the loss of environmental diversity, the extinction of plant and animal species, and, hooray, the suffering of animal populations, then it will cause great harms beyond those it does to human beings. All right, great, finally, you say, having read thousands of pages before getting to this sort of thing. Um, unfortunately, this claim seems to have had absolutely no impact on the rest of the report, um, even in the ethics section. So right after this, value gets discussed in economic terms, um, in terms of use value and non-use value. Um, and well-being gets discussed, there's a whole section on well-being where it's discussed as if it only applied to humans. You occasionally get sort of suggestions that maybe this analysis is incomplete. Um, there's a claim that non-market values uh, aren't very well captured because the quantification methodology for them isn't quite there yet. Um, and the report sort of mentions in passing the possibility that nature may have value beyond that which is attributed by humans. But those possibilities aren't explored any further nor are these non-anthropocentric values included in any assessment of the impacts elsewhere in the report. All right, second exception. Uh, this is in the Sustainable Development and Equity chapter. A little statement of biocentrism there for you. Um, the ultimate end result for sustainability assessment is the well-being of all living beings. Again, hooray, but um, all that ends up getting said about the well-being of non-human beings is that, quote, it still remains difficult to assess, end quote. And then in the assessments of the impacts that follow, there's no effort whatsoever made to assess it. So if we read these two claims, the, the two claims and the exceptions, against the background of the rest of the report, the conclusion we're left with is something like this. Animals might, or do, have a welfare that might, or does, <coughs> matter to the goals of climate policy. But no one's going to investigate the matter further, and the impacts of climate policy on this welfare will not be included in our attempts to manage climate risks. It's worth noting what a strange set of claims that is. All right, so one justification for this might be um, that in fact these other things that, that the, the reports are looking at, biodiversity, either narrowly or broadly construed, and ecosystem services, and even human welfare, are serving as proxies for animal welfare. All right, so, you know, maybe not perfect, but they're basically getting us in the neighborhood of animal welfare. Um, and you might think there's, there's some good reason for doing something like this, right? You know, when you're trying to assess these really large scale phenomena, you can't, you know, look at how each individual elephant is made upset by a drought, right? So, but you can look at the impacts of drought on elephants, the two species of elephants, right? And you can sort of use that as a decent proxy for its effect on individuals. All right, um, what I'm gonna argue is that these don't actually serve as good proxies for animal welfare, um, and that we need to consider animal welfare directly. So first, let's take a look at 
ecosystem services. So ecosystem services are the benefits that people derive from ecosystems. To measure the benefits that people derive from an ecosystem is not to measure the benefits that animals derive from an ecosystem. An ecosystem might provide benefits to us that it doesn't provide to other animals, so opportunities for scientific study, for example. Um, it can also provide benefits to us that come at the expense of other animals, so opportunities for hunting and fishing or something like that. So looking at how things benefit us is, is just not at all the same thing as looking at how they benefit animals. Um, I think this is probably particularly true as we sort of enter into an era where there's going to be increased conflict between humans and non-humans over things like land use. You know, maybe our interests converged when we were all thinking about mitigation. It's good for everybody if we reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But now that we're talking about adaptation and loss of damage, there's more conflict among the interests of, of the creatures involved. All right. So you might think there's a better case for biodiversity. Um, biodiversity isn't sort of just about humans, at least. Um, now, biodiversity is complicated. Um, as I think many of you know, there are a million different definitions of biodiversity out there. It's a sort of notoriously vague concept. Um, it's not just that there are different levels that you might look for variability at. It's that there are different ways that things can vary at that level. Right? So if you think about species, right, is sort of species diversity just a matter of how many different species there are in an area? Or also how different those species are from one another? If you don't want 100 species of ants. It's not bio, very biodiverse, or how many individuals in each species there are. And you get sort of definitions of biodiversity that answer to, to all of these. Um, but I think, sort of stepping back from this, um, in all of these defin definitions of biodiversity, what's being measured is essentially variety. And I think variety isn't the same thing as flourishing. Right? So among humans, this is pretty obviously true. I can work in a department that you know, has all kinds of diversity in terms of philosophical style and nationality and you know, ethnicity, and yet we're all completely miserable. So diversity doesn't necessarily get you <coughs> happiness. All right, you see the same thing among non-humans. Right? A region with high biodiversity is going to be full of lots of different kinds of individuals. They might be miserable, their lives might be barely worth living, but if they're alive, they count positively toward biodiversity. The only time that welfare is going to affect biodiversity is when it affects reproduction or mortality to such an extent uh, that it affects their relative kind of variability in the population. So for example, if, uh, if it gets so bad that the species goes extinct. All right, so to care about biodiversity, I think, is to care about the existence and the presence of kinds. It's not to care about the welfare of individuals or communities that belong to that kind. All right, and then finally, maybe sort of obviously, human welfare isn't the same as animal welfare. Right? We still regularly benefit ourselves at the expense of animals. Um, and while maybe we would sort of all ultimately be better off if we harmonized our interests with one another, um, even that wouldn't make their interests the same as our interests, right? And that's sort of one of the fundamental things that we're claiming when we say that animals are independent creatures with a good of their own, right? Our good isn't the same thing as their good, and that's an important moral fact. All right, so I think conceptually these things are all distinct from animal welfare. Ecosystem services, biodiversity, and human welfare just aren't the same thing as animal welfare. Further, I think given what they are, it's not guaranteed that improvements to them will produce improvements to animal welfare. There are a lot of ways of protecting each of them that would be detrimental to animal welfare. So we could kill off populations of animals that are interfering with ecosystem services provided by plants. We could choose ex situ biodiversity conservation programs, so this is sort of breeding and captivity, um, that offer miserable lives for the animals involved. We can improve our own access to food or fresh water by moving to new places and displacing animal populations. So I think if we really think that animal welfare matters morally, um, using these, these proxies as ways of measuring it will suffice. I think there's a case to be made that we need to look at animal welfare directly. OK, objection. Somebody might say, maybe, maybe not anybody in this room, but a potential person could say, 
But look, at least for wild animals, we're not responsible for their welfare. Right? You know, we don't think it's our job to, to protect rabbits from eagles or to protect rabbits from you know, a dry season or an early winter. And so now that the climate is changing, why well, I think all of a sudden we're responsible for everything. All right, I think there's two points worth making here. Um, first of all, I think this question about responsibility is a bit of a red herring. The IPCC is aiming to understand the impacts of various choices about climate policy in order to manage and reduce risks. It doesn't say anything about trying to understand the impacts that we, whoever that is, are responsible for. Right? There's no claim about responsibility. It's looking to figure out what the good and bad consequences of various courses of action will be. Second, I think when policymakers choose policies that affect others, they thereby acquire a responsibility to at least consider the interests of those affected by their policies. So I don't think we need to think that humans in general are responsible for wild animals in general um, in order to think that when our climate policies might do great harm to animals, that fact, fact ought to matter to us. That said, sort of further point, it's also worth remembering that this climate change problem isn't one that, that animals brought upon themselves. Right? So some humans and some human institutions uh, are probably on the hook for this. Okay, policy issues. Um, so what is probably in the back of a lot of your minds are sort of issues of feasibility and plausibility and you know, are you kidding about this. Um, and so I want to sort of make a case for the, the feasibility of, of this in practice. First of all, um, I think I want to argue for the importance of, of including animal welfare in our study of impacts. Um, these are the impacts that are being used to guide policy choice. If we only evaluate policies in terms of their effect on biodiversity, and we don't evaluate their effect on animal welfare, we're going to choose policies with complete disregard for how they affect animal welfare. Right? And so I think given the role that these studies of impact, impacts are playing, right, this is sort of the data about the consequences that we're using to make our consequentialist decisions about what to do. It's really important that consequences for animal welfare be included in what we're looking at. Okay. Is this realistic? Um, I think it is. And I think it's particularly realistic right now. Um, currently, if you sort of think about the way the sustainable development literature has gone, um, there's been a lot of pressure put on very narrow, reductive analyses of human welfare. Um, so assuming that sort of GDP is a good measure of human welfare. Right? In the sustainable development literature, people really criticized that and it's led to all kinds of interesting um, developments. So you know, the capabilities approach came out of that, the happiness index came out of that. But what we're seeing is sort of narrow reductive assessments of welfare being replaced by um, much richer, more complex assessments of welfare in the case of humans. A lot of these richer, more complex assessments of welfare involve assessing things that humans share with other animals. So animals might or might not, ask Mark, um, be sort of measurable in terms of GDP. Uh, but <coughs> things like suffering and happiness and lifespan, those are all things that, um, that, that we do share with them. Um, I also think that, that there's been a push for these kinds of models um, coming from developing nations, coming from indigenous groups who think that their welfare really hasn't been well measured by these sort of narrow reductive measures. Um, and so an example of this is the Warsaw International Me Mechanism on Loss and Damage. Um, so this is sort of the, the primary umbrella right now that loss and damage assessments are going on under. And uh, the sort of first task that they took on was this big assessment of what they called non-economic um, and out of this came a lot of interesting stuff, right? So they put a bunch of pressure on what it is to measure values and what we should think of in terms of which values are measurable. And then they looked at a bunch of different methodologies for measurement. Um, methodologies that involved non-aggregative, um, 
sort of multi-dimensional assessments um, that you know, didn't involve assumptions of commensurability and that sort of stuff. So there are a bunch of different methodologies out there um, that I think could be of considerable use to people who are, are interested in trying to account for the local economic economics. Finally, um, in environmental ethics, there's also been a lot of pressure put on some of these, these reductive measures. Um, so I think we heard in, in Virginie's talk this morning, um, criticisms about the use of ecosystem services and biodiversity um, as sort of a way of covering all non-human values. Um, and there's been a lot of pressure on that from within environmental ethics, arguing that you know, even if you're just talking about ecosystems, just looking at those things isn't really going to capture you know, the value that, that we think ecosystems have and that we're trying to, to preserve. All right. Um, so what is this going to require? I think we've already talked a good bit about this year, and a bunch of people are way ahead of me on this, Mark in particular. Um, so look, there's a lot of existing data on this sort of stuff. And it's a matter of sort of getting it packaged in the right way for policy use. You know, policymakers want data. The IPCC wants data. So turn it into data, right? We've got a bunch of facts. You just need to make it look like data. Um, maybe that doesn't get you published in science, but you can get paid attention to that way. And I think given the IPCC's own understanding of what can count as evidence, um, they actually have a very broad description of what kind of evidence for things they're willing to consider. So here's their, their description. Um, forms of evidence include empirical observations, experimental results, process-based understanding, statistical approaches, and simulation and descriptive models. So that's pretty broad. There's some room there. Um, a lot of people have worked hard to sort of open up some space for broader discussions of welfare, but I think this is something that, that can be advantageous to people who want to argue that, that we should take account of them in welfare. Lastly, um, I think it's important in the sort of policy arena to be mindful of history and context when going about advocating for these things. Um, I think both on the animal side and on the sort of holistic environmental side, uh, People who are concerned about the non-human world don't always have a great track record. People you know, in developing nations and indigenous communities aren't always thrilled when they hear that Westerners who care about nature are coming to town with a project. Um, and I think one of the issues here is, I think there are lots of groups that I think would be natural allies in advocating for considering animal welfare. I think you know, the push toward considering a broader range of values has largely come from developing countries and from indigenous groups. Um, and I think those folks ought to be allies, but I think there's a history there. There are reasons why those relationships aren't always friendly. And so I think it's important to bear that in mind as activists and to sort of approach forming alliances with a sense of humility um, and looking at what other people are trying to do and trying to all right, so conclusion, I think this ought to be an area of convergence. Um, I think this is something that animal ethicists and environmental ethicists agree on, that animal welfare matters. Um, and I think animal welfare is a sort of glaring absence from climate policy <coughs> and um, So I, I sort of feel like, and again, if, tell me why I'm wrong about this, but I sort of feel like this is something we can all get on board with, um, and it'll achieve many of the mutual things. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Um, one of the, in, in the list of things that um, climate change impacts on the human quality of life, mm -hmm. uh, one thing that stood out to me was the increased incidence of suicide mm -hmm. as being predictable. And suicide seems to reflect the assessment of one's life that one's suffering uh, outweighs the positive aspects of continuing to live. And I'm wondering uh, about the phenomenon then of animal suicide. We have some incidences, it seems, uh, that could be called suicide, whales beaching themselves, and so on. But as far as I'm aware, suicide is not a common feature of animal uh, life. And does, should, should we take that to be 
indicative of, uh, if that's so, indicative of the fact that from the animal's point of view, uh, it's th their assessment of their own welfare indicates that uh, they um, regard their lives as worth living. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so the, the quick answer is, I don't know. Um, here's the more complicated answer. I mean, I think there's a bunch of questions you need to, you need to answer before getting a good grip on that. Um, one is how do you understand the difference between suicide and sort of altruistic behavior? Um, so there's some things that animals do that sort of provide for their offspring or their mates that result in their own deaths. Um, does that count as suicide? No. The other is, are animals capable of suicide? So I don't know why whales beach themselves. Um, and whales, maybe, maybe it is suicide. I'm not sure all animals are, are capable of, of thinking about, much less committing suicide. So their lives might be not worth living as judged by them. But the fact that, that we might not get evidence for it by their behavior. So I feel like there's a bunch of stuff about sort of animal minds that I would want to know a lot more about before, before I could feel like I had an answer for that question. Yeah, yeah. thank you for, for this um, pretty interesting talk. I was wondering whether, uh, have you, first, have you ever considered to join the IPCC assessment? You or anyone <laughs> here in the room? Because indeed these uh, assessments are um, academic assessments and uh, maybe in the IPCC it's something like one-fifth of the scientists are um, humanity scientists. And uh, myself, I've been engaged in the IPBES, which is the little sister of IPCC on biodiversity and ecosystem services. And uh, I think that, for instance, the little quote you mentioned, like an animal welfare uh, deserve attention, but uh, for something like five words, like these ones, it could take hours and hours of discussion, negotiation, because this are not uh, academic papers. Mm -hmm. These are uh, hardly uh, built scientific consensus that has to be adopted by the member states. Mm -hmm. So on one hand, I don't really agree with you that it's somehow insatisfying, but that's the last assessment. And that's much, much better than the, for instance, 2000 assessment and this may be somehow uh, desperating little sentence could be just a fit in the door yeah. uh, that will be fulfilled for instance uh, when the time is coming for real assessment and all these multi criteria assessments are making their way a lot of people are trying working hard making some interesting qualitative assessment multi criteria assessment so just, I don't think it's enough to, but I just want to mention that if maybe, I don't know, three of you <laughs> were engaged, what that means, either to be uh, nominated by the state or to work on the peer review process because the whole uh, documents are open to peer review for a couple of months before being edited, surely that won't be a good publication or a very uh, strong uh, analytic argument toward the uh, animal welfare, but it can make a very important job toward this opening uh, doors. Yeah, I think um, I can mostly agree with what you said. I mean, I think this sort of, and we've seen this with other sort of openings up of discussions that weren't in previous assessment reports. You get the little foot in the door and then the other part of it is sort of bringing political pressure. There have to be enough, you know, the member states have to not nix it before, you know. So I think part of this has to do with what I think my role as an academic is. And I think, you know, so I've <coughs> not at all considered doing this in part because I talked to John Broom, who did the ethics section, and he was ranting and just had nothing good to say. Um, so he scared me off. But, uh, <laughs> but I think there's there's an important place for folks in the academy to be sort of criticizing these assessment reports from the outside and yeah. saying, hey, you guys missed something. 
And I think that kind of external pressure is also important in sort of causing that foot in the door to push it open a little bit wider next time. And that's sort of what I see myself as doing here, being sort of an external critic saying, hey, here's something that a bunch of ethicists pretty much all agree on, and you're acting like it doesn't even exist. That seems like a problem. And so that's sort of what I'm trying to do, um, a different way like this. You over there, yeah. Uh, I was wondering if this Warsaw International Magazine, is this an uh, insurance industry thing? Or no, no. It's, um, so it is uh, at the, I can't remember which COP meeting it was. But anyway, it was, um, it's a sort of sub-organization commissioned by, set up by the UNFCCC um, at the, or sorry, the, the parties to the UNFCCC at one of the COP meetings. Um, so at the COP meetings, this is the conference of parties, the, the parties to the uh, framework convention on climate change. Um, and they got together and decided they, they sort of needed to understand loss and damage, and so they were going to set up this working group at first um, that was in their commission a bunch of papers, and the working group would have these responsibilities, and check back in two years, and sort of give their report, and then they decide whether they keep it going or not. So it's, it's that, and these kinds of working groups get set up all the time. One reason I ask is uh, how people sort of convergence and possible partners and stuff. I've been in Montreal like Texas and Chris and the insurance. Mm -hmm. the insurance industry is like a multi billion yeah. dollar industry whose job it is is to accurately assess the possibility of catastrophic losses. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, for instance, if a state decides, you know what, we think the integrity of our ecosystem can have a dollar value attached to it, we're going to sue X off of that dollar value. The insurance industry can affect the data. Partner for finding politically tractable forms of value mm -hmm. based on these sorts of things. Nice. So, something like that in combination with the assessments that Mark was proposing might lead to some very effective lawsuits. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Great. So, um, <clears throat> biodiversity is definitely not animal welfare, as you pointed out, but um, I think there are scientific reasons to think that there will be some positive correlation between overall levels of animal welfare and <coughs> overall levels of biodiversity. And, um, and I guess in theory, I, I totally agree that we should be studying animal welfare a lot more. But in terms of uh, like a global assessment of you know, how climate is going to affect animal welfare, etc., it just seems so much uh, less feasible, tractable than assessing biodiversity, that maybe we're stuck with biodiversity as a as a proxy for animal welfare. So, so I'm thinking in terms of global assessments of biodiversity, we have the Living Planet Index done by the World Wildlife Fund, we have numbers of threatened species done by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. But as this conference demonstrates, people can't even agree about what animal welfare is, whether it's net negative, net positive within an individual life, especially across individual life. It just seems so much more distant, the prospect of plugging animal welfare per se into something like this than biodiversity. Aren't we just stuck with biodiversity and maybe some other things as proxies for animal welfare? I don't think so. I think we are where biodiversity was a while back. So, I mean, I think sort of, again, to refer to Mark's talk, you know, there's a lot of like, all right, well, this doesn't really capture it, but it's the only thing we've got numbers for, so we're going to go with this. And I think that's been kind of the approach. Like, you know, like you sort of, you start with what's measurable, um, and you, what, what you got numbers for, and you put that into your, and, you know, and that's what you work with. And as an ethicist, I hate this. I want us to start with what matters and figure out a way to measure it instead of starting from what we already have data on. But, if you had told people 50 years ago, like, oh, we're going to look for, you know, we're going to try to find a measure of the way that, you know, different organisms in an environment differ from one another. They'd be like, well, we can't even agree on what kind of differences matter. Is it genetics that matter? Is it ecosystem niche that matter? So, in a sense, I agree with you about the state of affairs. Like, no, we, we don't have a, an animal welfare index. But, but making one would not be rocket science. Right? Yeah, we'd have to answer some hard questions. And we don't have to answer them like to a philosopher's standard of 
soundness. But we need to come up with some kinds of things that we can move forward on that we basically agree with. And then we need to collect some data that supports it and show people how to do it. Get your wildlife biologists and your veterinarians and your animal mind specialists and put them in a room. Tell them they can't come out until they have a rubric. Right? These things, this isn't difficult to do. So we haven't done it yet. But that's part of what I'm saying is I think, I think we, we need to do this. Um, I, th I think it can be done and, and I, think, I think it should be done. So I don't know if that's satisfying, but that's what I'm saying. Yes. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it, it, it was a, a follow-up on what you mean to remark. Um, I think you're right when you say that it's important to give, uh, give this kind of uh, analysis from the outside of uh, the, uh, this kind of research tool. And uh, but I'm also wondering, like, I think uh, philosophical uh, journals are. Or read by or or read by uh, academics, and uh, I think it's what I what I see um, what is important in your work. I think is that it's not in a big report with uh, uh, five hundred of pages like to be like in, <laughs> in twenty years, <coughs> like people can read it, and um, I think it's important to. Uh, to give this information and this kind of analysis to uh, citizens or uh, just uh, activists, um, especially maybe for the part on history you mentioned, uh, because I, I think in, um, uh, there is some uh, convergence between, for example, uh, First Nation uh, communities and uh, environmental group or uh, activist group, but. I think the question of animal warfare is is not really um, a just question in, in, in this group. So we try to see how we, we can uh, uh, find a convergence between uh, the First Nation interest and uh, the environmentalist interest, if I can say that. Uh, but yeah, the question of animal warfare is not really discussed. So I think like to yeah to, to, sh to show that it's important to think think of it and, and can be convergent with uh, environmental policies uh, it's quite important like yeah i agree and i actually think this might i mean i think that sort of political alliance making might affect some of the accounts of welfare that look like better ones you're just you're going to get a lot of agreement that nobody wants starving deer it's going to be harder to get agreement that, you know, well, you know, things experience more suffering if they reproduce in this way, so we should kill them all off, and, you know, or sort of more hedonistic, utilitarian, sort of techie ways of assessing things. I mean, I think some of the proposals that have come out here, lots of folks who care about the welfare of animals will go, what? And maybe that, that surprise can be overcome, maybe not, but I think sort of just as a practical political matter, looking for those areas of convergence around animal welfare um, is, is a good idea. And I think there's I think there's a lot of there's a lot of agreement to be had there. Okay. Yes. Right, so yeah, I was reluctant. I, I didn't know where to raise my hand because I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna be boring thinking about the same thing. But uh, yeah, I mean well, I was really one of your slides, I mean, the one uh, concerning the, the effects on, on animals. You were depicting a situation that resounds me so much of the, of the current situation for many animals, because, uh, I mean, we, we live in houses, we have uh, heating, air conditioner, and, and so on, but for the animals, I mean, the things aren't like that. And not only that, but in the case of generalists, I mean, they are, they are pushing all the time. So they are uh, continuously trying to reach new areas in which they eventually uh, end up uh, being for a while and then maybe dying because uh, the weather conditions are, are not appropriate for that. Not only that, there is also the case of, um, you might be familiar, sourcing dynamics in meta populations where there are populations that aren't viable. Uh, and in some cases, this is weather conditions. In some cases, it's like, like food or whatever. But they keep going, 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 going because there is all another population that 
So um, I can perfectly see how for, for, for a number of animals um, this will really mean a change. But uh, for many others, I mean, uh, I'm not sure uh, what, what change this will mean. I mean, and, and I totally agree that there are other reasons to be concerned about this. I mean, some have been presented uh, uh, by Jeff. I also think that, uh, you know, the increase in biomass is significant. But, yeah, I mean, with that, I, I'm not pretty sure. Yeah, I mean, I think I, so first of all, I wrote all this before I heard your paper. Yeah, uh, but I think I had board. this sort of, the, this sort of weak idyllic view before that, and now I don't know what to think. Um, but I agree with you. So I mostly, you know, I wanted to sort of lay that out as just, look, there's some big consequences for what choices we make here. Right? Whether we mitigate, whether we don't, but that's going to have a big effect. Could it be a net positive effect? Empirical question. And, and I agree with you. We, we need to find out. So it's true that all the, the impacts I was describing were sort of negative effects. But my point here is we need to figure out what the effects of our policy choices on animals are going to be. And it, it's an empirical question whether those will whether it'll be all bad, like the sort of picture I was painting, or whether it'll be mostly good, like the picture you were painting. I don't know. And I, I you know, my only claim here is it matters morally, and, and so we should find out. Yeah. I, I think it's going to be bad, anyway. Yeah, I know. <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> we have a bit more time, so you and then you. Yeah, um, thank you. I agree with everything you said. Oh, yeah. So I want to <laughs> kind of comment on, on some of the comments. Um, so for instance, um, even though there is disagreement about what exactly the correct theory of welfare is, we definitely measure impacts on human welfare. So I think they shouldn't like restrict us philosophical questions uh, from assessing animal welfare as well. I mean, currently there's animal welfare scientists who are assessing animal welfare. And for humans, we do not uh, only take into account biodiversity. I mean, for humans, welfare matters. So I think it's just not fair that we should also consider welfare for, for non-human animals. And about your, your comment about that whether animals commit suicide, uh, very, I, that doesn't mean that you are skeptical whether it's that bad for the animals because after all they don't commit suicide or was it just a question about like general interest in why do animals not commit suicide? It, it, it was the former. The former, yeah. Yeah, then so. they, they keep pushing into uh, these habitats. Why do they do it? I mean, it's uh, there, there must be some uh, uh, some impulse to uh, living that. Uh, that, that, that the animal considers to be um, better to live and suffer than uh, not to live at all. Right. Well, right. I, think, I, I think Otherwise, they would be committed to I think her point was that about whether or not to climate change or what we do will cause animal suffering. <coughs> I mean, independently of whether they still are I mean, trying to stay alive, I don't know whether human babies or mentally disabled humans would think about committing suicide, but nevertheless, some things can harm them, and that seems to be morally relevant, whether or not they are capable of thinking about committing suicide. So, I was a bit, was a bit unhappy with the suggestion that I heard there that, um, oh, is it really so bad? Do you want to comment on that? Um, uh -huh. I agree. <laughs> Thank you. Is it a follow-up, Greg? It's sort of a follow-up. Okay, unless, unless somebody else. Uh, we we have one more question. You can go ahead if it's, well, if it's a follow-up. <coughs> go ahead. This is sort of a follow-up. Yeah, I mean, I uh, I appreciate the fact that we have overall indicators of human well-being, like life expectancy, and then surveys about uh, life satisfaction, etc. It's just really hard for me to imagine how you come up with an overall measure of animal welfare from insects to Okay, insects is a tricky issue. Well, insects like, or even fish from fish. The way fish animal welfare scientists do it is like assessing the needs of animals. Like even like if you only like take basic things into account, food, water, some shelter. I mean, and some needs we know. Uh, we can also like find out what an animal is willing to pay for something. You know, there are these kinds of uh, studies, and then 
to what extent it is needful to fill it. I mean, these are quite simple ways. Oh, there, there are 80,000 different vertebrate species, and each of them has totally unique food and other kinds of requirements. Yeah, but I mean, we, we, we know some things, and things we do not yet know, we could still make an effort to come to know. I, I just want to point out, so um, we do this all the time for farm animals, there are all kinds of, of ways of doing it, and, and in zoos too. Zoos have all kinds of people who are animal welfare specialists, and do assessments of animal welfare. So, and they deal with lots of different species, and not all the species on Earth. But, look, we're not counting the biodiversity of every acre of Earth either. So I don't think we want to hold this to too high a standard before deciding, you know, in order to tell ourselves that we Okay, we have two last questions. You okay, so uh, I just want to thank you for taking the approach on policy. I think that's an interesting angle into this discussion. Um, I want to then come back into your conclusion <coughs> here, which talks about creating a convergence with climate policy between animal and environmental ethics. But I want to then really like frame this question in the case of these policy decisions that are to be made it's very problematic when you have things like COP, as you are suggesting, and the Paris Agreement, when you have all these international countries with different interests as well that come from different climates, right, and have different cultures. So to have a successful policy come out of this that we want to see, we would need essentially a stronger middle point that would be able to have countries kind of come to agreement on something, right? And so if we need this middle point to really tackle climate change, is animal welfare the best known point to do this? And do you think that that would create enough collective uh, enforcement, or do you think that we should be looking for these new known points just as we need to find a new ethic? Yeah. Um, I think a couple things to say. Um, first of all, I was criticizing the content of the IPCC reports, which is different from, it's independent from the UNFCCC and the COP meetings. So the aim of the IPCC reports is just to sort of put out the information, to give information to the people who need to make decisions about climate change. And I'm just arguing we should have animal welfare information as sort of part of what's being put out for people to consider. Um, in terms of the, the COP, you know, how you get agreement is very interesting there. Um, I think I found it very interesting that the, the way that the Paris Agreement took place, the sort of voluntary um, pledges from countries, I thought was a really interesting way of handling the diversity of needs and <coughs> values and interests um, that each country brought to the table, and you got significant commitments. Now, some of that, we'll see, but I think there are ways um, of handling this that don't sort of require a whole new ethic or a whole new, you know, sort of new structures. I think there are ways of managing agreement and disagreement and negotiation and conversation that where you can sort of bring people to the table and get agreement without sort of having to change the course. Yeah, yeah. So you say it is possible with what we have right now, we just need to apply ourselves? Yeah, I'm optimistic, but I'm like the last person on earth who's optimistic about, you know, climate emergency right now. <laughs> we have one last question over there. So I was thinking, um, one additional thing to be said in favor of including animal welfare stuff in there, which I think applies even if it's like complete, suppose it's completely unrealistic that governments would ever take this into account in their decision making. Including it in the IPCC could incentivize research on things like what's the best bang for the buck in like helping animals adapt and stuff like that. Because it creates like this high profile outlet where that research could find a home versus now since it's not in there, it's like, why would you do this research since it has no possible home to go get to? And so then like philanthropists and other people could like unilaterally invest in some of that stuff and predictably would if we have this knowledge on how to do it. Um, so it would have that positive thing, I think, even given the most pessimistic assumptions about that. That's great. That's a very good point. Thanks. That's that. Thank you. Thank you.